So with that, ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Christina Ruggiero, Chief Executive Officer of Hindustan Coca-Cola Beverages. Uh, Christina has been, I would say, one of the critical forces behind Break the Ceiling, Touch the Sky. I think uh, she has spoken at probably at least four of our summits in the last uh, three years, or four years. And uh, what really amazes me, Christina, about your support is you're always there for gender diversity. You're always there for your people. And you are there, whether it's as a participant or as a speaker, you will do whatever it takes to support the cause. Uh, Christina is the first female CEO of Hindustan Coca-Cola uh, Beverages, if I'm right. Uh, she has also got a pretty unique background. She started her career as a cryptologist in the U.S. Navy and has been working uh, for the National Security Agency at the time, but has an illustrious, illustrious uh, 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 range of achievements across the Coca-Cola company. She was voted uh, our top CEO from House of Rose Professional uh, by a panel of 33 independent uh, judges uh, last year, was voted the top CEO for gender diversity. So Christina, you have such a long list of accomplishments it's difficult to cover all of them. So with that, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you so much for your support. And over to you, Christina. Thank you so much, Anthony. And it is absolutely a privilege and an honor uh, to be part of uh, Break the Ceiling, Touch the Sky and to be uh, a, a sponsor and supporter of House of Rose. Um, as you know, this is something I firmly and deeply believe in. So first, I just want to welcome everyone back for lunch. Uh, normally, I have the after lunch section for some reason. Um, so I appreciate you're all just settling in. We can't see you. So you can finish chewing. You can get yourself composed. Uh, get yourself a refreshing beverage. Um, and the way it's basically going to work is we're going to have a little bit of a chat. I'm going to share some slides. I'm not going to talk to them. I'm going to talk around them, but I will leave time for question and answer. My commitment to you, as always, is that I will be as real and authentic authentic as I possibly can as we go through this. Um, so feel free to ask me some of those tough questions um, and hopefully we'll be able to find some of the answers together. Perfect. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, and, and I think, you know, why are we talking about diversity and inclusion specifically now? And I honestly believe it's more important to talk about this than ever. One caveat, a lot of the photos I have are pre-COVID photos. So I don't want anyone to be upset if people aren't wearing masks and social distancing. We, of course, practice this every day at Coca-Cola, except all of my photographers are working from home. So I don't have any good photo shoot for pictures for you over the last couple of uh, months, but just as a, a little bit of a disclosure. As we think about, um, I'm sorry, this isn't the right presentation, but that's okay. Um, before I do anything, I really wanted to start with, with safety. And, and the reason why it's so important to start with safety is for the last six months, every single conversation, every presentation that I've made has really had a start with safety. So why should today be any different? And why is it so important for us? Um, yesterday in India, we crossed 50 lakh cases of COVID positive. And it's very difficult as a global citizen to hear so many places around the world have uh, really kind of more emerged than we have. And we certainly have our own unlock, uh, version one, two, three, four, that we've gone through through the, the, through the country. But the concern on safety is still there for people. It's still real and it's still tangible. Um, there are still parts of our country that are under containment zones or lockdowns. Um, and it is really difficult because I know as I was talking to colleagues and friends and family around the world, they were like, okay, well, if you're, you're kind of frustrated, just go out for a walk. And when you live in a place where you can't go out for a walk, it, it's really frustrated. So our accommodation had to be a little bit more uh, specific to what we were actually doing in India and some of the things we went through. So it's important to keep safe. It's important to do business safely and not become paralyzed by what's happening in the world around us. And so many panelists before me have talked about the power 
of understanding what we can control. And I think that's a really important piece. So, so why in the middle of all of this are we talking about diversity and inclusion? Why is this so compelling today? I think if we think about the fact that all of us have felt like an outsider or an insider at different parts of our lives. I grew up in a really large family. I have four sisters. I grew up in a joint family home. And in that home, often I was absolutely an insider. I was involved in things all of the time. But if I think about when I was in school, and if I'm honest with you, probably from the time of seventh standard, I would always volunteer during my lunch break to help one of the teachers or one of the professors. Um, and I would help them grade work or help them uh, organize paperwork. And I think it was because I was so afraid to eat lunch by myself in the cafeteria because I felt like an outsider every single day. And no one likes feeling like an outsider. And, and this is really a basic of, of human behavior. And although, as Anthony so rightly pointed out, men and women are different. Um, but in this, we're exactly the same. And all of us want to be included. And throughout um, this pandemic, the pandemic has really made all of us outsiders. Now, some of this we've anticipated. So a good example is in Hindustan Coca-Cola, we had a series of summer interns that were scheduled to start right in the middle of pandemic, in the middle of lockdown. And we spent a lot of time very carefully developing a virtual induction and work program for all of our summer interns or any of our new hires that joined during the lockdown phase. Very thoughtful. The feedback we got from the virtual um, work we did around interns and new hires was better than the work that we had done for normal hires that would come into our offices because we had anticipated the need. What we didn't anticipate, what I think no one anticipated, is before COVID, I can legitimately tell you, I had no idea there were 740 districts in India, nor would I understand that every single one of them can behave slightly different. And in those 740 districts, we found that men and women were all feeling isolated, alone, even though they were all going through exactly the same experience. So we took this opportunity to say, how do we make sure we leverage this moment where everyone feels like an outsider to make sure that we change this and that we make sure everyone becomes an insider, men and women, young and old. And part of this is to make sure that we had a virtual table. So a little bit more from my childhood, we had a large family, everyone had an opinion, and we didn't always agree. And when we didn't agree, what happened is my mother had called us all to the kitchen table. And at the kitchen table, this is where we listened, we had a voice, we had an opinion. Now, after we left the table, we all had to go with what we agreed as a family. But the kitchen table was something special, and it was some place where all of us felt known and heard. And in a company, our associates feel no different. Everyone wants to be at this table, even though now the table is virtual. And now the table's virtual, it actually becomes harder. Um, I think Julie did a brilliant job this morning talking about resilience. Resilience is so important for us. If we think about some of the emotions that people were feeling, whether it was our family, our friends, our colleagues, our associates, secretly ourselves, was more about burnout and fear and anxiety and stress and all of these things come together. And if I'm really honest, when I listened the most deeply, when I listened the hardest, women had a little bit of a tougher time. Why? And I think maybe it's because we were compounding all of these issues together and we had a lot of basics that we were dealing with. So I'll just my personal learning, right? I'm in a situation where normally I spend a lot of days on the road, either in factories with my sales teams, with customers, uh, with consumers, and for months spent time doing everything remotely from my house. At the same time, I have two teenage sons and they're trying to go to school online. Um, seventh standard, 10th standard, and getting ready for exams. And it was normally, you know, extremely stressful for me, even though, you know, they were sitting at the table with me sometimes, um, following up with them, they were struggling for different reasons and were having a hard time adapting to online learning. They're still doing online learning. 
But in the beginning of the pandemic, if I think about back to the end of March, the beginning of April, when India moved to a full 100% lockdown, and all of us were trying to figure out what's an essential service, how do, how do we actually understand how to operate our businesses safely, what's the right PPE, how to make sure we navigate through this. The first couple of days uh, within the COVID-19, I live up country um, in Bangalore, that's where I am today, and I'm outside of the e-commerce grid. So what does that mean? Uh, food aggregators, regular uh, e-commerce do not deliver to my house. So the first week of trying to figure out permissions, safety protocols, whether or not we were going to be able to operate factories or not, how to keep our people safe or not. Um, at the same time, I was trying to figure out how to get food for my family. You know, and, and my weakest, darkest moment, I'll share with you, with all vulnerability and humility, was, you know, one moment, it was probably three days into the pandemic, and I kind of looked in the mirror and said, you know, how am I supposed to refresh India if I can't figure out how to feed my family? And then I realized that those voices were not helpful voices. We all have them. But whether or not they control us and what we can do about these things are the most important thing. So what I did was I called some of my neighbors and we were able to gather food together and find a local farmer who was able to come to the house and find a milk delivery van. And within two hours, we had a successful network of food delivery and supply chain into my neighborhood. And within a couple of days, we were able to have a very effective operation um, from the day of full lockdown for Coca-Cola across India. So it's okay to have our feelings. It's okay to express them. It's okay to ask for help. But I think it's important to realize that all of us have these struggles. It's what we do about these struggles. It's what we do about these, these inner voices that sometimes are our greatest champions and our greatest enemies that make us the most successful resilient leaders that we can be. When we listen and we share our challenges and share some of our issues, everyone becomes an owner in helping to solve those issues, which is the best way to get to a successful resolution. So a little bit about generation. I think right now during COVID-19, the generation gap feels the largest. I think that it's been. Um, certainly our largest amount of customers, consumers, employees in India is rapidly becoming millennials. Um, if I think about the people who are digitally native, uh, so quick personal story, my, I mentioned I have two boys that are teenagers, but when my youngest, um, I'll never forget one day we were uh, in my mother's lounge and he went to go turn on the TV. Maybe he's about three years old and comes running over to me like, mama, 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 you know, Nana TV broke. Nana TV broke, what's going on? So we go over and he's upset, man, his TV is broke. He doesn't have very many words. And I said, show me, show me how it's broke. And he was trying to swipe the screen on a very normal, old fashioned television. And you see some of that still happening. So one of the things that absolutely will stay in the new normal is the need and a desire for a technology, a digital revolution. Um, it will be led by the people who grew up digitally native, but it's really important for two things. One, we appreciate that part of the digital transformation is a desire, a need, a craving for immediate feedback, immediate resolution, uh, and immediate input. And a lot of that is driven by social media culture. But we also have a large population of people who, like myself and, and the generation before me, who didn't grow up with some of this technology. So we need to make sure that we're incorporating them as part of our inclusion journey as well. We especially see this with women returning to work during this COVID time. So there's a little bit of an intimidation factor, especially if they've taken a career break to have children to come back into the virtual office great to work from home, but not sure how to work all of this technology or be able to contribute. So making sure that we do not just capability training, but change management on digital is really important to make sure that women are successful in our workplace. So things that we've been doing at HCCB for a while, um, we spend a lot of time making sure that women have an equal chance of getting any job. And there's lots of ways to do that, right? So there's blind hiring, there's um, diverse panels, diverse slates, all of that great stuff. But what we found is that there were still roadblocks. There were still psychological barriers behind some of these people getting jobs and having opportunities. So 
for me, the biggest key to this is about role modeling and having uh, very active support, men and women. So we need everybody working on this. Uh, one of my best examples was we had a lot of pushback, particularly from supply chain and from manufacturing on women having jobs and because they, they couldn't do it for a variety of different reasons. And I've always prided myself throughout my career of taking jobs that um, people thought women couldn't do. So Anthony mentioned I started out in the military. I used to run a warehouse. I worked on the stock exchange. Um, I ran a supply chain. All of these types of things were where women weren't able to do these jobs. And I remember having a conversation uh, in one of our depots and they were saying a woman couldn't run a, fa a forklift truck. And I was so frustrated about why you think a woman couldn't run a forklift truck. Well, she can't. A woman can't do this. When I went and got the PPE equipment, I looked over the quick safety procedure for the vehicle. I've run forklifts before and had a license um, in two other countries and just moved the forklift. And then everyone just looked at me and I said, okay, now women can drive forklifts. Let's stop talking about this. And now we have women forklift operators. So much of what we, what we see is about how do we evolve how we think about these things? And then more importantly, how do we evolve what we do about these things? So new things we're focused on is really using this opportunity to reinvent diversity and inclusion in a different way. And these are all things that we've talked about and done before, but I just wanted to share with you a little bit of how this is different this time. So for example, for family insurance, we've always had great medical insurance and life insurance at Coca-Cola. Now we have family insurance that includes coverage for your parents. We found that more people were very stressed about parents being sick, and those parents did not have adequate private medical insurance to help them, especially during COVID. And we were able to do this in the beginning of March before all the lockdowns happened. So a lot of these changes were about proactive, aggressive measures to get people in the right place at the right time. We've all been talking about uh, employee research groups and women networks uh, probably for the last 20, 30 years. To make sure that we were listening and we refitted and made sure we have a fit for purpose women's network was really important for us. So things that we did were really think about what things the women needed right now. So we spent a lot of time understanding all different types of wellness, stress management, personal finances, children care, parent care, um, e-medicine, and made sure that um, our women network is actually sponsored by a man, uh, one of our senior men leaders in the audience because in, in our organization, because we wanted to make sure that we had men as advocates and allies at the forefront of everything that we were doing. The whole piece around back to work, I think there's been so many tremendous examples. So much of this has led to a really interesting DNI conversation around anybody can do any job anywhere. And I think if we start with that fundamental belief, um, it actually unlocks so many powerful things for us as leaders in corporation and also for, for any diverse party, especially women. So many of the perceived barriers around workplace have been either physical location, ability to travel, ability to be able to flex your hours and perception of flexing hours. And COVID has taught us that actually women are just as, if not more effective than men in an environment where we take all of those barriers away. So how do we create an environment where back to work can be a work from home situation can be a partial work from home situation or fully back in our factories or some of our offices. One of the things that we've done that I'm probably most proud of, and I think lots of people have work from home packages that are very standard and great. We've done all the benchmarking where you can work from anywhere. We help you with technology. We help you to make sure you have a desk and a chair, all of those great things. But one of the things I love the most about our program is you get a certain amount of money or points to be able to pick. And it's not just the bandwidth or the chair that's part of it. You can pick a house plant. You can pick a picture frame. You can do lots of things because 
at Coca-Cola, we have a very strong appreciation that the big things matter and they need to be there, but the small things matter also. And making people feel connected, regardless of where they're working, is incredibly important for us as an organization and is incredibly important for our associates. So we had a, a nice kind of achievement where we had um, reach some of our targets around uh, representation, uh, female representation across our organization, across every level of our organization, including leadership team, including board of directors. Um, and we've had the most wonderful journey over the last three years. I think part of this journey is that during that time, when we've actually brought the, the representation up and we still have a lot of work to do, our net worth has doubled during that exact same time period. If I think about 20 years ago, um, and I've been passionate about DNI my whole life, people would say to me, okay, well, what's the business case? What's the business case of this DNI? And 20 years ago, I would cringe a lot and get so frustrated and angry. Why are you asking me for this business case? And I'd be pulling studies from all different places. And today, when someone asked me for a business case, I could not be more delighted. I have my own arsenal of data that has every single data point supporting the fact that diversity and inclusion will support unequivocal business growth. So now I don't even wait for someone to ask me for a business case. I'm asking them, do you want to see the business case? I have a business case. Do you want to see it? And now, thankfully, they're telling me, no, I don't need it anymore. So I think it's really important that we have this kind of firm in our head and firm in our thoughts, um, which is really important. I do want to share with you the origin of this picture because this is one of my, my favorite things, actually. Um, so we all know that there's a thing called Women's Day. From a very early age, I have always had a very deep-seated, I think the word is anger, about Women's Day. Um, anger. And it's funny because I don't feel that way about Mother's Day. Maybe because there's a Father's Day. And for those of you who are parents, if you have a Mother's Day and a Father's Day, Mother's Day is usually a little nicer. Maybe that's why. But um, I remember being pretty young and asking my grandma, who was very wise, Grandma, why don't I, why am I so upset about this Women's Day? What do you think? Um, and she looked at me and she said, well, because there's no Men's Day because every day is Men's Day. Like it was the stupidest question she's ever heard in her entire life. How could I not see this? How can I not move forward? And for me, doing things to be able to make a difference for people, I think is really important. So my first kind of Women's Day in India, um, I abolished flowers and we started doing um, capability programs. So I wanted to teach people how to be more articulate, how to understand their own finances, how to make sure they can have career conversations. And it's evolved. And this past year, we actually did um, something I'm more proud of uh, this year. And we said, okay, in HECB, we can do more for our community. Our people have a lot of advantages. So these are all women from different neighborhoods. These are women who came into our Bangalore office and we opened our doors. I think it turned out to be about 500 women around the country. And we taught them and physically sat with them to write their very first resume. We did career coaching for them. And then anyone who showed up with a degree but a self-confidence issue got to have a mentorship session with me or one of my uh, senior leaders in the organization to give them a boost of confidence to go out into the job market. Um, and this is all of them holding their new portfolio with their new CV, their new resume as they go into the workforce. Now, some of them um, have come to work at, at HCCB, but many of them are just out in the workforce and feeling confident and, and making a big contribution. Um, so for, the, for me, this is one of the, the proud data points of things you can do, um, as Anthony said, if you're a woman who wants to make a difference. So inclusive leadership is important. Having champions is important. Um, and it's a continuous process. It's not something that's just gonna be done. It's not something that's over. Even for the best organizations that have all the right processes, all the right policies, um, and have very progressive leaders, we still have issues. So I'll, we'll also share with you, I had an issue yesterday. And we're having a talent conversation. We take talent very seriously. This is a global Coca-Cola conversation. You have equal representation of men and women in the room. And one of the, the male leaders I know is having a conversation about his direct team and how they're doing. 
and it's someone who is an advocate for change and um, has done a great job of having 50-50 representation of gender in his actual team. And as he has the conversation, he starts talking about the first person, the first person's a man, and he's talking about all these lovely assertive qualities of this man. And then he starts talking about the second person, and the second person's a woman. And then he uses words that I cringe when I hear, which is, well, she's a tough lady. You know, but we have to watch, he's a little aggressive. And I'm kind of watching the virtual room, and I'm listening to this a little bit, and not a single person after listening to this says a single thing. Not the men, not the women, because as a senior leader, this is someone who's always been a DNI champion and just lets it go. And for me, this is when we need to speak up the most, right? So unfortunately, or fortunately, I had to stop the meeting and say, hey, I just want to make sure we have a check because what I hear is that we're saying the same behavior, the same output, the same thoughts, the same work, but for a man, assertive is positive. For a woman doing exactly the same thing, aggressive is negative. Everyone in the room is devastated, right? The man is embarrassed and he's trying to apologize and trying to course correct. And all the women are secretly texting me going, thank you, thank you for saying something. And I'm texting them back, no, you should have said something. We can't be passive if we're going to be able to make this change journey. And each and every one of our voice is important. Men's voice, women's voice, young voice, old voice, all of us are part of this. And all of us have unconscious bias. So if we want to make a difference, we have to understand this. We have to understand that men and women are absolutely different. But we still have a lot of the same needs around belonging, around insiderness, psychological safety, work safety, and making sure that we feel included, that we're heard. When we don't share, when we don't speak up, when we don't champion and role model our beliefs, we take one big step backwards from making the change that we need, from making the change that we want. Each and every woman needs a man as an ally and advocate for us to be able to make these changes. But more importantly, we need other women to be part of this, to be more comfortable with our own voices and for role modeling the behaviors that we'd like to see across our society. So for me, very quickly, as we're defining our new normal, today we have a very unique opportunity. We are shifting and defining a new normal right now. And diversity and inclusion has just as requirements to be part of that new normal today as it ever has been. Only today we're armed and fueled with more information in order to be able to make that happen. My closing thoughts for you are integrity matters. Curiosity fuels each and every one of us. Resilience sustains. Go be the role model you want today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I don't know if it's, I've heard your inspirational speaking a few times, Christina, but you always manage to, to touch me in a very uh, unique way and inspire all of us. So we're going to take a few questions uh, for you. And Uma is going to uh, run those questions. Uma, over to you. Yeah. Hi, Christina. The first question for you is from Deepak Rao. He wants to know, how do women avoid the guilt trip of not giving enough time to the family while they break the glass ceiling and pursue higher goals and ambitions? So I, I thank you so much for the question. I always find this interesting. There are days I'm good at this and days I'm bad at this. I find it fascinating. No one ever asks a man if he feels guilty. Ever. Why is this? Why are the, we're the only people who are responsible, caring people about what's going on in our family? I don't know if it's true, but I get asked very often. The answer for me is be choiceful and purposeful in the moment you're in. Each and every one of us makes choices about what we do with our day and how we lead our day and make our choices. So whatever choice I make, I make sure I commit to that choice. And I'm very courageous in those choices. So what does this mean? I... I'm very careful and mindful to be part of my children's life without apology. So if my children are, they both play musical instrument, if they're having a concert, I go and say, okay, you know what? I'm sorry, I'm leaving the office for 90 minutes. I'm going to my children's concert. And then I leave. 
And you know what happens? Nothing. Nothing happens. I was so, I had all this stuff in my head. What are people going to think? They're going to think they can go to their kid's concert too. Isn't that great? Oh, it's parent-teacher conference. I need to go to parent-teacher conference. Excuse me. There are times when my children want to come and play with me. And I say, I'm sorry, mommy has a board meeting. And my kids are learning about what it's like to have a woman who's a professional. And they will respect that as they get older, especially because I have sons, especially because I have sons. My children, if they know I'm busy, can help make dinner. They know how to make chicken and rice. They can do all of these things because I taught them they have to help and be responsible. So there are days when I feel guilty. Yes. Do I keep this guilt? No, I let go of it as soon as possible because I have to understand I'm making that choice. I'm deciding which to spend time with my kids, which to spend time with work, and be wherever you are, be super present. So if you decide you're going to be at the concert, don't be on the phone. Don't still also be working. Be with the kids. If there are times you can't be with the kids and you have to tell them, I'm sorry, I have to work, it's okay. They've been doing this from, for their fathers for hundreds of years. They'll get over it. It's all right. They can go and ask somebody else. Or what happens is they become independent and resilient and they can figure out things on their own. So, so I believe that the guilt is only in our own hearts and only individually can we set ourselves free. Thank you. Amazing. Uh, there's another question from Payal Basu, which is kind of linked to the earlier question. Uh, most of the women would want to be the best version of themselves in every aspect of life. Best daughter, best mother, best professional, best wife, and so on. Is it really possible to be the best version in all aspects when you reach the top of the organization structure? If yes, then throw some light on it. If not, then how can one be at peace with themselves even when she's not able to be the best of herself at some areas? So I think I love this question. And, and I desperately try to be the best of myself in moments. Okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> So I can't be the best everything and pulled in a hundred different directions. This is physically impossible and exhausting. So what I try to do is I, I live by my calendar. For those of you who don't organize your time, this is something I would encourage you to do. I try to make sure that, you know, for me, example, to be the best daughter, right? So certain things I always do. I have a routine. Now, this is the first time since living in India I don't live with my mother since my father passed. So it's hard to be in a different country, but I make sure that I talk to her every day. So I have a little time in my calendar, which is catch up with my mom. And I try to do nice things, maybe once a month. Sometimes I send her flowers. Sometimes I'll send her a little gift, a little chocolate, maybe a book. Hey, mom, I'm just letting you know I'm thinking of you. When she needs me or she feels insecure, I try to be there for her. Now, that takes me, I don't know, one hour a month. But if you ask her or you ask my sisters, they'll tell you I'm the best daughter. But I don't spend all day worrying about being a best daughter, right? I make sure someone can take her to the doctor's office, et cetera. My husband, I try to make sure we have time to get to spend time together every day and have a chance to really connect. And what I found specifically in this a little bit of unlock over it was now we can walk a little bit in, in India. And my husband goes for walks. And for those of you who are married, I actually encourage this. Because what I found is that um, one second, I'm having a minor issue. Can you hear me? We can hear you, but it's cracking a little bit. Okay, I'll come back on the video. So what I found was as we're walking side by side, that we actually talk more comfortably because we're not sitting all day. So. I'm having a lot more better conversations with my husband because they're less confrontational, right? So in that, I feel really good. Because my kids are doing school from home, I'm spending more time with them and helping them with their homework more than I would if I were traveling. So, so I think it's how do, we, how do we make sure that whatever we're doing, we feel the best at that moment. I think the, the most important thing is we also have to be the best at taking care of ourselves, which is something I have always struggled with. But 
Um, I'm really trying to be much more purposeful about spending time to relax, spending time to meditate, um, and looking after myself. So hopefully that answers. No one expects you to be the best of everything every minute. Forgive yourself in advance. Thanks. There's one more question from an anonymous attendee. How do you go about choosing your mentor and get a buy-in for him? How to mentor you? So it's funny because I actually didn't get onto this mentorship craze until much later. I didn't even know I was allowed to ask someone to be my mentor, which is a funny thing, but it just had never even occurred to me. I think I had always just gravitated to people that I admired for different things and went over and talked to them. It wasn't until much later in life, I think I was already 40 before I realized they were actual mentors. But what I realized is that I couldn't expect one person to do everything for me. The same way you can't expect to be everything for somebody either. So for me, I found groups of people, six, seven, eight people that I admired for different things that I talked to about different things. You know, and some of it was professional, some of it was personal. You know, how do I do a better job of helping support my children uh, when they're, you know, they're teenagers and they don't want to communicate? Some of it was about how do I feel more confident speaking up in a meeting if I don't agree with something. Some of it was, how do I talk about my salary and raise? I don't feel comfortable. Who do I talk to? And, and finding different people in your life and just asking. I think the important thing for me, though, is some of my best mentorship was stuff that, that is just really quick in the minute. I may have just had one amazing conversation with somebody, and I might not connect again with them. And then there are other people that I've had relationships where there's back and forth coaching or one-way coaching for decades. So don't put so much pressure on yourself. If just try, look and connect with people that you are inspired by, that you think you can learn something from, and let it see, take it from there. You know, I, I think so many people are so stressed out. I, one lady came to me and said, I want to talk to you. I need a mentor. And she had an entire spreadsheet of attributes and people and weighting scales. And, you know, for me that the best answers are mentorship is about relationship and chemistry and learning and progress. Um, try things out, experiment, have candid conversations, be honest with yourself and honest with that person. Um, if it works, you can have a lifelong relationship. If it doesn't work, you'll learn something from that as well. Uh, that was an amazing, um, amazing session. And uh, thank you so much for your support to break the ceiling, touch the sky, and also to uh, the work that we are doing. Uh, a round of applause, virtual applause for Christina.